And now what I want to talk about is the independence assumption and why we need it and why it pops up. So the independence, the independence assumption is what makes naive Bayes naive. Right? So if we didn't assume independence, it would just be a Bayesian classifier. And the fact that we are assuming independence makes it a naive Bayes classifier, and that suggests that this is not a very good assumption. If something makes something naive, it's not a very good thing. <clears throat> so uh, now, how does this come up? What we need to do is we need to estimate this part of the equation, probability of the observation given a class. So what does this mean? This means assuming that the patient has avian flu, the Y, what is the probability that we see the following symptoms? And you list the symptoms that he has, right? Or assuming that the digit is class three, what is the probability for seeing this kind of an observation? Or likewise, assuming that the digit is mm, seven, what is the probability of seeing this type of observation? So that's our X. So we need to estimate it. And the reason I'm writing it x1 through xn now is because, remember, we're representing our instances as a set of attribute value pairs. So it's not just one x. Inside that x, there is n different variables, little x's. And what we need is we need the probability of all of them taking the values that they do, assuming that we're in the class y. So that's what we need to assume. Now, how can we estimate, <clears throat> how can we estimate the probability? that probability. The simplest thing would be to count. So we need to compute how many times x1 through xn occur in class y. Right? So we could just take this particular observation, this set of symptoms, or this set of um, pixel values, and count how many times did we see it for patients with avian flu, or how many times did we see these pixel values for class 7. Um, and there is a problem with that. The problem with trying to do things like that is that you will not get any reasonable counts. You will get zero counts for almost everything. Why is that? Because there are lots and lots of attributes, right? So even in this toy example, we have a 20 by 20 bitmap. Even if we represent it in binary, a black or white pixel, right? there are two to the 400 possible bitmaps, possible configurations of 20 by 20 bits, right? 20 by 20 pixels. So that's how many possible total values there are of such uh, little bitmaps. And that is a huge number. It's a really, really, really big number, right? It, no matter what kind of a training set you have, you will never have a training set that covers all of these possibilities, not even a tiny portion of these possibilities, especially once you realize you don't just need to see it once. You need to see it once for every class. Right? So you need to see this example for class 3 and for class 1 and for class 7. Otherwise, you have zero counts. And if you have zero counts, all probabilities turn to zero, and things are not happy in our lab. Right? So this is not feasible. Uh, it's even more infeasible if you're dealing with something like language. So if we're dealing with spam detection, remember, we're representing emails as binary vectors. So the word either occurs or doesn't occur. And we're talking about the whole vocabulary, vocabulary, right? Every word that we we'll ever expect to see. Even if we really constrain that and say we're only ever going to have 10,000 words in our vocabulary, uh, which is not realistic, even if you do that, your event space is two to the 10,000. And that number, you know, good luck. So you, you will never have any data set that includes that many items in it, right? So it's completely impossible to count how many times these x's occurred for each class y. So what can you do? Uh, what you can do is you can note that even though I never observe the whole thing, right? I have plenty of observations of individual words or individual pixels, right? So this whole thing might never ever repeat in its exact form. But this particular pixel, the fact that it's sort of grayish, uh, that will happen. That will happen in all sorts of uh, classes. And I can count that, right? So how do I go from there to the whole observation? And that's where the independence assumption comes into play. I have 400 attributes here. I can't count them jointly, 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the probability of each one of these 400 attributes is independent of the other attributes. And that allows me to count the attributes individually by themselves. So basically, uh, for class one, I'm going to count how many times that pixel is blank. right? And for, and for class two, and for class three, and so on and so forth. So, and that's something that you can do. That is something that you will have enough data for. Now, once you do it, you will need to sort of agglomerate those probabilities back into the overall probability of the observation. So how do you do it? Through an independence assumption, you can decompose the joint, which is what you really want, right? This is your reflection. This is your approximation of how often this observation, x1 through xd, occurs for class y. You can decompose it into a product of probabilities for individual attributes. So now xi is just one little attribute, so that's one of my 400 pixels. I'm computing the probability for that pixel being that particular color, given class three or class seven, and then I'm gonna multiply them all together, all 400 of them, and that will give me an estimate of the overall probability of the observation. Right. So uh, now, it turns out that these are equal if the attributes are independent of each other, right? If the pixels don't so they, if they don't correlate in any way. So I'm showing a middle step here. Uh, the first step, this is actually chain rule. So this, uh, this equality always holds. Uh, so you're just conditioning each attribute now by on all the attributes that came before it in a product, right? And this is exact. This always holds. And then what you do is you assume that xi is independent of everything that came before xi. So all of these axes cancel out and only one and only y remains. <coughs> remains. That is the assumption of uh, independence. That's, the, that's what it allows you to do. And I hope I've convinced you why you need it. Now, um, assumption of independence is a bad assumption because we know that things like words and pixels are not independent of each other. They are correlated, right? So if that pixel is black, the probability of the pixel next to it being black is a lot higher because that's how we write. We don't write in individual pixels, we write in strokes. So it's likely that the next pixel uh, will be black as well. Same thing with words. Words influence each other. Right. Uh, so it's a bad assumption, but, it is, but it's an assumption that allows us to estimate something, whereas before we couldn't. Right. Now, uh, a critical thing, a really important thing, is we're not actually assuming uh, full independence. We're assuming conditional independence. We're assuming that the attributes are independent given the class value. So why does it matter? What difference does it make? So here's an example. Um, suppose I have two events, right? I have an event that I go to a beach, and I have an event that I get a heat stroke. Are those independent? No, they're not, right? So if I go to a beach, the likelihood of getting a heat stroke is actually a lot higher, right? So you, cannot, you definitely cannot say that they are um, independent. So the probability of going to the beach and getting a heat stroke is a lot higher than you would expect it by chance. Right, so if they were independent, that probability would be just the probability of me going to the beach times the probability of getting a heat stroke. And that is a lot lower than the joint probability, right? So they're not independent. Now, um, if you think about it, uh, going to a beach, it correlates with getting a heat stroke, but you cannot say that it causes getting a heat stroke. What causes getting a heat stroke is hot weather, right? So if I know that the weather is hot, that does two things, first of all, it explains, if, if the weather is hot, that, uh, that increases the chance that I will go to a beach. It also increases the chance that I will get a heat stroke. Right. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, yeah, I could go to a beach in Scotland and it's very unlikely that you'd get a heat stroke. Uh, so, so really the factor that explains both of these events is whether or not the, w w the weather is, is, is hot today. Right. So um, what you could say is that once you factor in whether the weather is hot or not, the events of going to the beach and getting a heat stroke are ind independent of each other, right? Because either the weather is hot or not. If it's hot, then high, high chance of going to the beach, high chance of getting a heat stroke, high chance of getting those things together. Um, so in a way, the hot weather, it explains all of the correlation between going to the beach and getting a heat stroke. Right? So that's what conditional independence is about. You're saying that there is a factor, a latent factor, that is not explicitly present 
in your model that you're not observing, maybe, that explains your observations. Um, now, that's in general conditional independence. How, that, how this applies to classification is the class value, the y that we're trying to predict, that becomes our hidden factor. That is the factor that explains all the dependence between the attributes. So conditional independence, you're not assuming that all of these attributes are independent of each other. You're not assuming that pixels are independent of each other. You're assuming that once you know the class, that knowledge explains all the correlation between the pixels. It's an assumption, but it's a lot weaker than just assuming that pixels are um, independent. 